Let's go straight to Dr. Quinton Bradley, Senior Lecturer in Planning and Housing at Leeds Beckett University. And you're going to take us uh, on a further insight into the affordable housing and supply uh, issues. Quinton. Thank you very much, Dr. Best. I want to take an England-wide perspective to support Mike's presentation. And my question for this afternoon is why, when we're in a crisis of affordability, are so few affordable homes actually being built? And one of the answers is that we seem to ha have lost our sense of priorities in housing policy. So if we go back to a few decades, the goal of housing policy was to address housing need, and that meant providing adequate housing to all households, regardless of their ability to pay. Then, and largely due to influence from the United States, we started talking about affordability and stopped talking about housing need. And affordability is only concerned with the market price of housing and whether people can pay those costs. The housing need is a priority system. It says, we have a set of minimum standards below which no household should be expected to live. And we're going to make sure that every household lives in adequate housing. And we're going to provide ad adequate housing to people, starting with those in worst housing need. So the picture there is from independent research in 2018 that shows 4 million households in current housing need in England, a backlog of housing need. They've been living in these conditions for years. And we're talking about homelessness, overcrowding, or living in, in inadequate or substandard housing. The great thing about housing need is it actually gives you a deliverable goal. You've got a program of work. You start with people in the worst need and you move on up. And for decades, of course, in this country, addressing housing need was not only the goal of housing policy, but we actually did it. And we delivered adequate housing to households outside of the price mechanism, not using market house builders, but using public authorities and not-for-profit housing associations. And housing was not distributed through ability to pay, but was either distributed on a priority allocation system, or on many European countries, it was delivered as a universal service, irrespective of, of whether you had the money or didn't have the money. The cost of that housing was kept low because there was no profit involved for the developer or the landowner, and costs were restricted to those necessary to repay the debt and to manage the homes. If people couldn't afford those costs, then welfare transfers made sure that if the, the housing was affordable, and for many people, there was nothing to pay at all. So let's just cast our minds back to how we achieved um, the task of meeting housing needs. So from 1950 to 1980, local authorities built just under 4 million council homes. In no year in, that, um, in those decades did councils build less or fewer than 100,000 council houses. And for each of the, those years, the private sector also did what they like. They built around 100,000 private homes. Now, this wasn't a perfect system, but it was certainly a great deal better than the one we've got now. What has happened to the goal of meeting housing need in this country? And of course, the standard method that Mike referred to says it's about housing need it gives us an unconstrained assessment of the numbers of homes needed in an area, so it says. But it makes no distinction between whether you can pay for these homes or whether you can't pay for these homes. And it confuses market demand with actual housing need. So the standard method really gives priority to the people with the most money who can therefore buy the most housing. And those with 
the the little the, the 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 least money are left with whatever's left over. Of course, the standard method has at its heart this affordability formula, and this glorious bit of magic tells local planning authorities that if they provide the stipulated amount of land for house building, then every home built in their area will be automatically affordable at no more than four times average income. Now, although that sounds ludicrous, that's actually what the standard method of formula, affordability formula is telling us. So if we follow that logic, According to the standard method, there's no need to provide affordable housing because the market itself will adjust prices and everything will be affordable as long as you can afford a deposit, that you'll be able to get a mortgage. But the government still tells local planning authorities that they have to carry out an independent assessment of affordable housing need. And here we get back to those priorities homelessness, overcrowding, concealed households. So why are local planning authorities asked to carry out this separate assessment if the standard method is a count of all the household houses needed for all the households? And we've got a four-stage guidance from government telling local planning authorities how to assess affordable housing need. So let's put those two figures together. We've got the standard method. So that's the first column on this table you see, the annual housing requirement. And then we've got a separate assessment of affordable housing need. And that's the third column along. And you'll see some of those figures are in bold. And that suggests that in those local authorities, the amount of affordable housing that they require is actually greater or as great as the figure in the standard method. So if we look at Kensington and Chelsea, for instance, they need to build over a thousand affordable homes every year, but the standard method says they only need 670 homes, similar in Canterbury. What sense can we make of this? Because what is it telling us about the standard method and its accuracy if actually in some local authorities, they don't need any market housing at all. All they need to be built are affordable homes. Well, the trouble comes in here because you can't actually put these two separate sets of figures together in any way that makes sense because they use completely separate methods of calculation. In fact, the Court of Appeal has told planning authorities that they can't use the assessment of affordable housing need to make sense of the standard method. What's worse, though, is that the guidance from government, and we're talking about governments of all colours here because it goes back to 2007, to assess affordable housing need deliberately requires local authorities to undercount the scale of the housing need crisis. Now I'm going to show you three ways in which it does this, but it is standard across all local authorities and it's not just in this country either, it is built into the whole way that we plan for affordable homes. The first is that we know that there's a backlog of at least four million households currently living in housing need. The guidance to local planning authorities is to assess house, households in overcrowded or concealed or substandard accommodation in the first stage of their calculation, but then to assume that if they were to be rehoused in a new affordable home, they would free up the home that they're leaving, and therefore there would be no net requirement for new affordable housing. So they're counted and included in the first stage and then at the final stage of the calculation, they are subtracted again. So assessments for affordable housing need in this country 
built into the way that they are calculated automatically exclude the 4 million households that we know are currently living in housing need. But the next stage in any assessment of, a, of housing need is to think about future households. And as we know, the standard method is projecting forward the number of households who formed back in 2014 into the future. It's vital for us to know how many of those new homes that will be required should be affordable. How many of those new households who are going to form or likely to form will not be able to afford market prices? We've got to know that, but we can't. There is no way of marrying up the two sets of calculations. So the standard method projects forward households who, who formed in the past, and we could do the same for affordable need. We could say we have 4 million households in need now, so let's project that forward into the future. But instead, local planning authorities are told not to do that. They are told to look at the number of households on council housing registers and to only count those who've been rehoused in a year and to project that figure forward. This automatically disqualifies any, any real assessment of the number of future forming households who will be unable to afford market prices. In the final stages of the calculation of affordable housing need, local authorities are told to subtract from the total all the affordable housing that is currently available, all the affordable housing that will become available through relets or sales, and all the affordable housing that is likely to be built in the future, in the, in the future plan period. So they're instructed to think about all the allocated housing sites in the local plan to work out how many affordable homes they might get from those sites and to consider them available now and subtract them from the total number of households in housing need. Now, if we think about it, Mike's just told us really that 40% of all allocated sites never get built out and that developers routinely negotiate down their obligations to provide affordable housing on the sites that do get built. So you can see this vast overinflation of the future provision of affordable housing, which is designed to reduce to, uh, any, any accurate calculation of the scale of housing need. And at the end, local planning authorities then get a completely a minimized figure of the number of households in their area in housing need, those now and into the future. What do they do with that figure? Well, it just sits on a shelf in a housing strategy because then they just have to decide how many homes, as Mike said, it would be viable for the private sector to produce as a percentage of market homes on each allocated site. Mike's told us that's around 25% in, in Dorset, and that's fairly standard. You never get more than 35% in any local authority outside London. In London, it's 50%, but they never get the 50%. So there's no connection between the percentage of homes you ask the private sector to deliver and the actual number of homes you need. There is no monitoring of local authority success in delivering affordable housing needs. There are no targets for local authorities to build affordable housing. And you might say, really, that there is absolutely no priority given to meeting affordable housing need. That's not a matter of, of subjective decision. That is built in to housing policy. And every local authority is required to do the same thing to minimize our understanding of affordable housing need. That means that in this country, we actually have no real strategy to end overcrowding to end homelessness, or to provide adequate housing for all. There is no priority 
in housing policy except just to build market houses. It also means that the standard method is just telling us about market housing. It's not telling us about affordable housing. It's not giving us any numbers for affordable housing. So we're going to talk a lot about solutions. Mike, Mike's put his finger on one of the main ones, obviously providing social rented homes. We need to, to go back to the success that we had in the past, and that's really doable. But what I want to concentrate on is the sense of priority. We need to have, as a priority of housing policy, addressing housing need. And one of the ways to do that would be to give local authorities the power to reserve land only for social housing. Now, that could be done quite easily by creating a new planning use class for social housing. Governments of all colours are always tinkering with the use class categories that planning uses to allocate land. So it would be a very easy measure to create the power for local planning authorities to allocate sites only for, for social housing. That would automatically freeze the land value of those sites. Landowners would not be able to get any more for their land than they would for building social housing. It's so much more effective than exception sites because it actually gives far more power to local planning authorities. And it's a really small action to be taken, a new use class for social housing. The other solutions in this slide, I think will be talked about in the next, um, the next presentation. It's about prioritizing the allocation of land primarily. At the moment, all we're doing is saying we want houses on the land, provide X amount of land, any old houses. It doesn't matter where, it doesn't matter how much they cost. We have immense priorities in this country. We have to meet affordable housing need. We need to prioritize that.